Thanks, Travis and, and Richard. Um, if this is too loud or not loud enough, just let me know and I can try to move it around. Um, uh, thanks to Travis for inviting me and to uh, Richard for hosting to the Institute for bringing me out. This is, um, uh, this is a good opportunity for me to be here. I, I'm, um, I've never been to Washington State before, and when I flew in last night in a snowstorm, um, it uh, gave me memories of when I used to teach at Syracuse University and did that basically like every weekend flying into snowstorm. So it was sort of nostalgic for me, so that was kind of nice. Um, so it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing over the last few years with uh, my co-author, Matt Gardino, uh, who's a professor at Providence College. And over the last few years, we've been working on some projects trying to understand where uh, or the factors that influence Americans' views about uh, military support or military intervention. Um, but as I do that, I want to start with a, a story about somebody that some of you may be familiar with, um, and that's uh, Pat Tillman. Uh, Pat Tillman, as some of you may know, was an NFL football player in the early 2000s. He was a safety. He played for the Arizona Cardinals. Um, and uh, after the September 11th attacks in 2001, Tillman, like many Americans, was profoundly moved and really disturbed by what had happened. But unlike a lot of Americans, Tillman decided to give up his day job. Uh, at this time, he was a, um, a Pro Bowl safety for the Cardinals, and he joined the Army. Uh, he actually trained at Fort Lewis and joined the Army Rangers and eventually was sent and deplo deployed in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and Tillman was incredibly patriotic, uh, but as he was uh, nearing a de deployment to Iraq in February of 2003, uh, just as the United States was getting ready to invade uh, that country, um, he expressed a lot of misgivings about uh, whether that was the right thing to do. Um, as many of you know, Tillman is particularly famous because he ultimately ended up being killed uh, in Afghanistan in 2004 in a friendly fire incident along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Uh, that incident led John Krakauer, the author, to write a book about Tillman's life. He was an extraordinary individual in many ways. And one of the things that appears in Krakauer's account of Tillman's life, and in particular his experience in the military, were these misgivings that he had about the Iraq invasion and the lead up to it. And in uh, this book, When Men Win Glory by John Krakauer, he quotes Pat Tillman's journal. Uh, Tillman was writing in February of 2003, just before the United States invaded Iraq. And he wrote this about as he was sort of expressing his feelings about what was about to happen. He wrote in his journal, were our case for war even somewhat justifiable, no doubt many of our traditional allies would be praising our initiative. However, Every leader in the world, with a few exceptions, is crying foul, as is the voice of much of the people. This leads me to believe that we have, no, we have little or no justification other than our imperial whim. Now, this is interesting, obviously, for a soldier who's about to be deployed to Iraq to be expressing disagreement with what he was about to be sent into. But I would suggest that the most interesting about this is, is Tillman's reasoning which is that he, was, he didn't think that the war was a good idea, in large part because the United States allies weren't behind the invasion. And this was very disconcerting to him. As I said, Tillman is an extraordinary individual. Right? There's very few of us who would give up our day jobs, especially when our day jobs come with a $3.6 million contract, to go join the Army, right? to live a life in front of foul-mouthed drill sergeants and the specter of violent death, which ultimately led to Tillman's demise. But what I'm going to suggest in the talk today is that Tillman is actually very much like Americans in that in the lead up to the Iraq War, he was quite concerned about the lack of support for the military intervention that the Bush administration was proposing. It's not only the case with Iraq, but it turns out to be the case with other military matters that Americans do care a lot about what other countries think. And that's actually a pretty important finding because it has a lot of implica implications for how we think about not only public opinion, but also the prospects for future military engagements uh, by the United States. So over the next 25 minutes or so, this is what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm going to just talk a little bit about, first, um, the way that political science scholarship sort of conceives of Americans' attitudes toward war and military action. That is, what are the factors that uh, influence whether Americans support or oppose military intervention? And in particular, I'm going to talk ab about a dominant perspective uh, in that literature that suggests that what most of us do is we take our cues from our party leaders. And as we look to political elites that we ad agree with within the United States, and we see what they want to do, and then we sort of follow their lead. That's what's referred to often um, in political science as party cue taking. 
But what I'm going to ask is, when does that not work? That is, what are the conditions under which Americans don't look to their partisan political leaders for guidance about military intervention and perhaps look to other sources? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and that's going to form the crux of the argument of the talk. And then I'm going to talk a, um, in particular about an experiment that Matt Gardino and I recently did, uh, looking at Americans' views toward invading potentially Iran. Iran, of course, is a developing nuclear program, and that has been quite controversial. Uh, and has raised the prospect of another military intervention in the Middle East. So I'm going to talk about that, and then finally I'll wrap up and, and draw some uh, implications. Okay, so if we want to think about the role that international institutions or foreign voices might play in shaping Amer Americans' attitudes toward military intervention, we need to think a little bit about how political scientists and scholars typically think about this. And um, there's, a, there's a voluminous literature, as some of you know, on Americans' support for war. Um, but I want to give you sort of one of the predominant views, what I'll refer to as the prevailing view. And this is what I just previewed a minute ago, um, uh, which is the idea that what most Americans do, most Americans are not particularly knowledgeable about politics. They don't care that much about politics. And so what most of us do is we sort of outsource uh, the formation of our political attitudes in a lot of ways to political elites, party leaders that we think have our interest at heart. That means that if you're a Democrat, you want to know what Barack Obama thinks about some issue. If Barack Obama thinks we should have a universal health care plan because this would lower health care rates and provide more access to insurance for people, then you as a Democrat think, well, Obama's a smart guy. I like him. I voted for him. He seems to have my interest at heart. That seems like a good idea. If you're a Republican, you might alternatively look to John Boehner. I, I picked them both looking stern because it's just more fun you know, to sort of portray politicians in this stern fashion. Also, they're both wagging their finger at each other, which is actually a pretty good rendition of sort of how, how Washington works. Um, uh, but if you're a Republican, you might look to John Boehner and discover that Boehner opposes Obama's health care plan. And you realize that you know, Boehner and I typically are simpatico on these issues. And so... Sure, as a Republican, I don't think that's a good idea. This is the idea of party cue taking, that Americans look to their party leaders. Now, this has some important implications, um, uh, one of which is that one inference that is often drawn from this model of public opinion is that party cues are essentially, essentially determinative of people's attitudes. That is to say that if Obama supports something, that if I'm a Democrat, I'm also going to support it. If John Boehner opposes something, that I, as a Republican, am automatically going to oppose it. And there's some literature that sort of is often interpreted as suggesting that this is the way that Americans reason. They simply look to their party leaders, and they just do what their party leaders say that they should do. They hold attitudes that are consistent with the positions that party elites hold. One of the really important implications of this, though, is thinking about this from sort of the perspective of democratic theory and what we want government to do and the way we, we as citizens want to interact with the government. Because it suggests that domestic elites, that is our political leaders, our government officials, can in many ways sort of dominate public opinion. This model suggests that when Democrats and Republicans in Washington agree on something, then public opinion is likely to coalesce behind that very proposal. But when Republicans and Democrats divide, only then will you have polarization in the public because re Democratic citizens will follow their Democratic cues and Republican citizens will follow Republican cues. But what's really important about that is it essentially says that whatever political elites want, they can sort of dictate to the public what we will think. Right? It's a little disconcerting if you think that this is, in Abraham Lincoln's words, supposed to be a government by the people. So this is a little sobering. Right? I don't want to be too much of a buzzkill, so let me suggest that maybe that's not a completely accurate story. Right? So there's a puzzle, though, that's raised by other research that seems to show that, in fact, in many cases, Americans will resist the messages that they receive from part partisan leaders. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about this is there's a variety of studies that seem to show that under certain circumstances, people will resist the cues they, re they receive. One of the interesting things about this in the political science literature is that, in fact, one of the very studies, Berinsky, 2009, that's often cited as evidence for this sort of strong partisan cue-taking story, also actually has quite a bit of evidence in that same book. This is a book called In Time of War, which is a very good book in many ways. But it also has some, some evidence that's quite contradictory to that perspective. And so this raises a puzzle and, and raises the question, well, if Americans sometimes aren't following the, the cues of their party leaders, why is that the case if 
it, there's pretty solid evidence that Americans would sort of prefer to delegate these decisions to elites that they believe are probably more qualified to make these decisions than they are. And so that's what I want to focus on. I want us to think. I want to think a little bit about sort of when will this party queue taking story be a less powerful explanation for the patterns of public opinion, and in particular the way that Americans think about <coughs> these political issues. And so I want to suggest in the work that Matt Gardino and I have been doing is that. Uh, there's two factors that are likely to lead citizens to reject the messages that they're receiving from like-minded party elites and, in fact, in some cases, turn to alternative sources of information. Um, and the first of those is that when party leaders, government officials, send messages that are at odds with citizens' own predispositions. Okay, let me explain what I mean by predispositions. By predispositions, I mean underlying values and beliefs that Americans have, that everybody has, that orient us in terms of our political issues, in, our, in terms of our political positions. Uh, these may be values, for example, egalitarianism or individualism, values that are deeply held that help us think systematically about what government should or should not do or how the government should or should not behave when it's conducting foreign policy. So let me give you an example of that. If we think about foreign policy, one important predisposition is people's preference for resolving foreign policy disputes through military means versus diplomatic means. Right? That is, some people may prefer that the United States use military might to solve international conflicts, while other people may prefer that, in general, the United States use diplomatic means. One thing that's important about predispositions is they are distinct from actual policy opinions. When I say policy opinions, I mean, should we invade Iraq? It's different than a predisposition. That is a value or some underlying belief that sort of helps guide people toward their specific policy opinions. And the reason that that's important is because sometimes <clears throat> the specific cues that citizens receive from their party leaders, even party leaders that they agree with, are at odds with the predispositions that they hold. Right? And we'll talk more, so I'll talk more specifically about the way in which that works in foreign policy. As you can imagine, when we as citizens are exposed to arguments from President Obama or John Boehner, people that we, depending on our party identification, often look to for guidance, when we receive messages from them or hear things from them that seem to be at odds with what our predispositions would tell us we want, the positions we want to hold, that may lead us to sometimes look to other places for guidance. So one possibility is that party cues are going to weaken when those cues are at odds with citizens' predispositions. Another thing that is likely to matter is that when there are messages that are consistent with citizens' predispositions that are available from what I'm going to call alternative cue givers in the media. Right? And so what I mean by this is that in circumstances where citizens are receiving messages that are at odds with their predispositions from their party leaders, but they are exposed to, in the media, arguments or messages from other political actors, that is, alternative cue givers or just anybody who's not a party leader or a government, government official, that are more resonant with their underlying values and beliefs, that may actually lead people to reject the messages that they are receiving from their party leaders and turn to these other sources. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by alternative cue givers. We can imagine that interest groups uh, might serve as an important political alternative cue giver. If we think back to the debates that were happening last year after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, you look in the news, right, the NRA was in the news all the time, arguing for uh, less aggressive gun restrictions than Democrats in the Obama administration were arguing for in the wake of that tragedy. Uh, the NRA uh, it sometimes becomes an important part of the media environment in political debates. Occupy Wall Street's another example at a sh fairly short-lived period of time in which they were in the news, but nonetheless. Um, th th these are groups that are outside the traditional party hierarchies that are not part of government themselves, but sometimes become part of political debates. In the context of foreign policy, what I'm going to focus on today and what a lot of this research has been about is sort of general a category of sources that we might think of as foreign voices. It is the United Nations, leaders of America's traditional allies, uh, people who, for various reasons, during U.S. foreign policy debates might find themselves being quoted in the news, and thus Americans might have access to their perspectives. And so what I'm going to suggest, and what the argument that I'm going to make today, is that when, when you have a situation where 
Individuals are receiving messages that are at odds with their predispositions from a, tr a, a typically trusted party leader. But they have access to information from an alternative cue giver, maybe a foreign voice, that is the United Nations, for example, that suggests a course of action that is more resonant with their underlying beliefs, that they may indeed, in that case, reject their party leader's position in favor of the position argued for by a foreign voice or some institution. This is true, right? This suggests some important differences between a party Q model of public opinion. And one of the things that's particularly important about this argument is that it directly implicates the media's role as a gatekeeper of political discourse. Because if this argument is right, right, that is, citizens are only likely to resist the messages from party elites when they are given access to information from alternative cue givers in the media. That means that citizens are only going to be able to sort of resist the messages from their party leaders when the media present these alternative ideas from these other sources. And so it suggests that, me, that news organizations' decisions about how to portray political debate can have a really profound influence on the contours of public opinion because it's effectively determining the perspectives to which Americans are exposed. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. OK, so let's talk about Iran. Uh, I'm going to show you some experimental data that tries to get at this notion of whether Americans' support for military intervention in Iran is or is not conditional on the messages that they're receiving from their party leaders and from foreign voices, in particular the UN. But I want to make the case, I want to suggest there's a reason that I'm choosing to study this debate over Iran. Um, one of the reasons is because the messages that some democratic elites have been sending about Iran's nuclear ambitions are at odds with many Democrats' generally anti-war predispositions. So as many of you know, uh, Iran has, over the last few years, been developing its nuclear capability. The Iranian regime argues that its nuclear capability is simply to generate power, that is, generate a source of energy. And it is doing this only for peaceful purposes. But of course, most of the international community, and especially the United States and the United States ally in the Middle East, Israel, is very concerned that Iran is actually trying to develop nuclear weapons to create, to make itself a nuclear power, and thus give itself the ability to influence geopolitics in a fundamentally different way and pose a threat, especially to Israel, uh, in the Middle East. Um, as a result of those concerns, President Obama and other Democrats have actually been quite hawkish. That is, have suggested that military intervention may be a reasonable response if the Iranians do not agree to give up what appears to be their desire to create a nuclear weapon. I'll just give you one example of that. Um, last year, uh, President Obama, shown here with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli uh, prime minister, um, gave an interview with The Atlantic in which he said, in part, as president of the United States, I don't bluff. Right? Um, and as you can see in the deck headline, he, he, he talked about how it was the strategy of containment was not something that the United States was likely to pursue. And in fact, it was unacceptable for Iran to actually gain the capability to develop a nuclear weapon. And he suggested in this interview that military options were one possible course of action. He left all of the options on the table, that he wasn't simply going to pursue a route to a diplomatic solution. Now, the reason that this is important is because if you look at survey data, you can see that most Democrats in the United States, when you ask them how should the United States solve its conflicts internationally, they're far more likely to say through diplomatic means or economic sanctions and those sorts of things as opposed to military action. And so this is a fairly hawkish, hawkish message that Democrats are receiving from the most prominent party leader in the country and a very popular Democratic figure, uh, Barack Obama. So that's one reason that Iran is a good case for investigating this possibility because you've got this mismatch between the messages that um, s Democrats are getting from President Obama and other Democratic elites um, and their own predispositions. Uh, the second reason is that it turns out that foreign voices themselves that is, representatives of the United Nations and other international institutions like NATO, 
as well as leaders of the United States, traditional allies like France and Germany, turn out to be a pretty big part of the media environment during foreign policy debates, over, during debates over American foreign policy. Some of the work that um, Matt Gardino and I have done, the book that Travis mentioned, and um, as well as some other political scientists have shown that when there is media coverage of foreign policy debates, often there's a, Americans have access to the perspectives of, um, uh, of leaders from overseas and um, other international uh, actors. And so that means that this is a case where both of the conditions to test this argument might potentially be met. You've got messages that are at odds with Democrats' predispositions from their party leaders, and you have a, situ a case where you're likely to have access to alternative cue givers, in this case, foreign voices in the media environment. Now, all that said, I'm not actually going to look at survey data and media content to actually examine this, despite the fact that this is an argument about sort of the way things are playing out in the real world. And, um, instead, what we did is we conducted an experiment. Um, uh, we embedded an experiment in the congressional, the cooperative congressional election study. This is a nationally representative survey of Americans that was fielded um, during the 2012 elections. Uh, the data that I'm going to describe to you, describe to you come from shortly after President Obama won re-election. That is, this is in a post-election wave of that survey. Uh, and that, that's important. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But it's actually important this took place in the post-election wave for reasons that I'll elaborate on later. So this is a nationally representative survey. But um, uh, what, what we did is we embedded an experiment in the survey itself so that different respondents in our survey got access to different information about the debate over the possibility of invading uh, Iran or launching airstrikes against Iranian nuclear facilities. So I'm going to describe the experiment to you and lay out the logic of how this helps us test this argument about what happens when people are exposed to messages from their party leaders that contravene their predispositions and what happens when they have access from uh, other voices, in this case foreign voices. So the way this worked is that respondents as part of this survey uh, were shown a vignette, just a short story about an Obama proposal for airstrikes against Iran. Now, hopefully what you're saying is that that doesn't sound right, because Obama has not proposed airstrikes against Iran, which is true, which means that's good, because you read the newspaper. right? You know he's not done this. right? Uh, but one of the things that, for those of you who know a little bit about social science experiments, you know is that you can actually convince people of a lot of things in a survey context. That is, if you tell them that Obama has done this, they're likely to believe that he has, because they think, well, this is a researcher who probably reads the paper even more than I do, and so it's probably true. Right? And if you have questions in the Q&A, if you're interested in about either one of two things, one, whether this is actually an effective tactic in trying to persuade people that Obama has done something like this, uh, or whether this is at all ethical to do, right? to tell people that the president is proposing a military action that he has not actually proposed, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Uh, as to the latter, the way this works is that after the experiment is over, you tell people the truth. And so they, don't, they are not left believing that the United States is about to enter another conflagration in the Middle East. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so the way this works, and I'll show you the vignette in a moment, is that respondents were told that Obama had suggested that the United States should launch airstrikes against Iranian nuclear facilities. Again, this is a plausible, if you know, Obama had not done this, but it is a plausible statement given the position that he had laid out. 695 respondents were, um, were part of the experiment. Now, here's the, here's the important part, is that the respondents were divided up into four different groups, and each of them was randomly assigned into one of, uh, one of four different treatment groups. And, the, and depending on which group they were put in, those people got different information. And they got different information about whether John Boehner and whether the United Nations thought that that was a good idea, right? that, that whether, whether or not Boehner and the United Nations agreed with this proposal to launch airstrikes against military action. And I'm going to show you the conditions in a minute. But what's important here is that respondents were randomly assigned into these treatments. So what, we're, what this allows us to do is to, after we've gauged people's support for this military action, we can then go back and compare whether the responses of people who are in these different conditions were different from each other simply because they were exposed to different information about what elites wanted to do. So at the end of this, and again, I'll, I'll go back to the vignette in a moment, at the end of this, people were asked a, a simple question. They were asked, 
Would you say that you support or oppose U.S. military strikes on Iranian nuclear facilities? Okay. And so this is the question that's designed to gauge whether or not people were supportive of this. All right. So let me show you what the treatments uh, looked like. So here's the experimental design. So the first, everybody in the, everybody in the survey uh, read this paragraph. And it said this. Hopefully you can see that. Type's a little bit small. Um, it said, says this. There's been a lot of debate recently about Iran's nuclear program. This month, President Obama suggested that the United States should consider launching airstrikes against suspected Iranian weapons facilities. Okay. And so this is the part of the experiment in which, in which respondents are told, Obama thinks that we should consider military strikes against Iran. Um, Everybody saw the same thing. But what differed then was what people saw depending on which treatment they were in. And I'm going to show you the four treatment conditions um, so that you'll have an idea of what the labels are when I show you the data and the results from this. Okay. So in the first condition, which I'm going to call Boehner Pro, UN Pro, this is a condition in which respondents were told that John Boehner, the Republican Speaker of the House, supported Obama's plan and that the United Nations Security Council also supported it. Okay. And so it said this, Republican Speaker of the House John Boehner has said he supports the airstrikes. Members of the United Nations Security Council also have said they support the airstrikes. Okay. And so this is a condition in which all of the elites involved, President Obama, the Democratic President, Republican Speaker of the House John Boehner, and the United Nations all agree. This is elite consensus. Everybody thinks we should bomb Iran. Okay. Now, so... One quarter of the, of the respondents were put into that group. The, another quarter of the respondents saw this. And in this treatment, they heard that Boehner supported the strikes, just like the previously. But instead of hearing that the United Nations supported it, they were told that the United Nations Security Council opposed the strikes. Okay. And so now we can, what this will allow us to do is to compare whether people in that first condition had different levels of support at the end of the experiment to people in the second condition. And the only thing that differs between those two groups is that one group was told that the UN supported it and one group was told that the UN opposed it. There's two more treatment groups. You should be able to figure out what they are by now. Right? One in which Boehner opposed Obama's plan, but the United Nations supported it. And then the final one in which both Boehner and the United Nations opposed the plan. So here you have Obama standing astride military action and Boehner and the United Nations both saying no. Okay. Now, it sounds like a strange alignment, right? And it is. Uh, but for the purposes of the experiment, it's important to there. And you'll see what the consequences of that is. Okay. So here's the logic, right? The logic is by comparing the levels of support among these different groups, we can then see whether simple variations in telling them that different groups of elites are aligned differently affects their attitudes. If there's no differences across the groups in terms of their level of support, then that means that elite alignment has no influence. Doesn't matter at all. But in particular, remember, given what we're trying to answer here, is it the case that especially Democrats, that's especially what we're interested in, right, are resisting a hawkish military proposal by Obama? And is their level of support especially low when they hear from an alternative cue giver like the United Nations that the United Nations opposes it, right? which is, of course, is a more predisposition consistent idea. Okay, so I'm going to show you the results of that. And I'm going to show you some very simple results. All of these results that I'm going to show you um, is the worst figure ever, right? Like, can't see anything. Okay, so what I'm going to show you when I reveal the data to you in a moment is that <laughs> it, I'm going to show you for each of the treatment groups the percentage of respondents in each of those groups that supported military action against Iran, right? That is supporting the proposal that Obama has laid out. And I'm going to show you that for each of the treatment groups, okay? So, in the first group, remember this first group, Boehner Pro, UN Pro, this is the elite consensus position, right? So Obama wants to, wants to um, launch these strikes, Boehner says okay, and the UN says okay. 66% of respondents in that treatment said, we agree. That's, that's a good idea. Now, the number 66 in and of itself, even without us comparing that to the other groups, which is where we really get the leverage to figure out what's going on, even that 66% is fascinating because it tells us two things. One, it tells us that Americans are somewhat reticent to support military action against Iran. And you say, well, that's a majority. 
But think about what they were just told. They were told that the President of the United States, just off of a resounding electoral victory, and the Republican Speaker of the House, who really does not like that guy at all, and the United Nations, which doesn't always have preferences that are in align alignment with the United States, much less the Speaker of the House, right, have all said we should do this. Yet a third of the respondents in the survey said, even given that, we don't think this is a good idea. So that suggests even initially that there is a limit to how persuasive any party actor or any elite figure can be. There's some reticence to support this. Okay, now, but what's really interesting though is what happens when we simply change the position. Right? What about the people who are in the condition where they were told that the United Nations opposed it? The only difference between these first two conditions is that the UN and the second one opposes it. There's a 12 percentage point drop in the, percent, in the, in, in the response, respondents who supported military intervention. Right? That star means that that's a statistically significant difference, meaning that we can say with 95% confidence that that difference is, um, that those two estimates are different. And this is pretty impressive because this is the, the sample sizes in these are actually pretty small. Right? So 12 percentage points by merely changing the position of the UN. What happens when we merely change the position of Boehner? That is in the third condition. Remember, the UN is supportive of Obama's proposal, but Boehner is not. We actually see that it is also statistically lower than the elite consensus condition. But it's not any different than the UN. And this is interesting because it tells us that John Boehner doesn't seem to be any more influential in the, again, um, on the public overall than the United Nations is. Right? Those two different, the 54 and the 58 are statistically indistinguishable from each other. Okay, so then what happens in the last condition where both Boehner and the UN are opposed? Support drops even further, 26 percentage points lower. When respondents are told that Obama wants to do something that is opposed both by Boehner and by the UN, they're very, very skeptical. Right? This is the only condition in which there's not majority support for this. Okay. So. This tells us that, one thing this tells us is that both party cues as well as cues from foreign voices are important. But it doesn't really allow us to test the hypothesis about Democrats and, um, in particular responding to a, a hawkish, hawkish message from their party leader. Okay, so I'm going to break the, I'm going to show you the same data, but it's only for, but I'm, the next chart I'm going to show you is only for Democrats, only for people in the, in the survey who said they were Democrats. Um, I'm only going to show you, be able to show you Democrats and Republicans. We don't have enough of a sample size to show you independents as well. As many of you know, independents are also sort of a mythical creature in American politics. Despite, <laughs> despite the fact that you know, about 35% of Americans will say that they are independent, if you actually look at the way that most of them behave, they behave like partisans. So the number of true independents in American politics is really only about 10%, despite all of the partisan rancor and all of the bad stuff that have is supposed to be happening in Washington, most Americans are partisans of one stripe or another. Right, so, but I'm going to show you just for Democrats here. Okay. This is the results when we look at Democrats. I'm going to call your attention to two things in the chart. So one is that overall, the levels of support for military inter intervention in every condition are lower than they are for the public at large. Now, that's not surprising. Democrats are more, more dovish, right? less likely to support a military action like this. But it also tells us how important those predispositions can be, right, in anchoring people's views about something like this. But the second thing is that turns out what really matters for Democrats is when they are given information that the UN opposes Obama's proposal. 54% of Democrats in the first condition, when told that Obama, Boehner, and the UN all support military action, they support it as well. But that number drops to 31% when they're told that the UN opposes it opposes it, and 36% when they're told that both Boehner and the UN oppose it. Right. The third condition, when Boehner is, um, to, when they're told that Boehner is opposed, but the UN is support, supportive, actually doesn't change, it's, it's not statistically different than the elite consensus condition. And so this suggests is that what's really moving Democrats is not John Boehner, not surprisingly. What's really moving Democrats is UN opposition. Right. Okay. So this suggests that presented with a predisposition inconsistent cue from a Democratic president, 
Democrats are somewhat skeptical, but they're really skeptical when they are told that the international community, in this case, the UN Security Council, opposes it. Um, and that activates their opposition even more. Okay, last slide, I'll the last data slide I'll show you is what it looks like for Republicans. Right? You know these are Republicans because they're in red, and there's like a law that you have to show Democrats in blue and Republicans in red. Right? So you can see what's really different about this chart. One is that the overall levels of support for Iranian military intervention or intervention against Iran uh, are much higher overall, not surprisingly. Republicans are more hawkish. Again, predispositions that lead them to be more supportive of these kinds of military interventions. Right? But also that um, there is not a, a, a main effect of the United Nations or even Boehner's opposition in the third treatment. That does not produce statistically significant differences from the elite consensus condition. Now, some of that may be a sample size issue, but what you can see is that Republicans are pretty hawkish, except in one case, when, as I've described it, you know, some what you might think of as an unholy alliance between the Republican Speaker of the House and the United Nations, which is no, you know, sort of is not beloved by the Republican Party. It's probably a fair way to say it. Um, that in that case, Republicans become very skeptical of Obama's proposal for military action. I don't have a full explanation for this, although I think one plausible thing is that Republicans looking at this and going, okay, if Boehner is agreeing with the United Nations Security Council, what Obama's doing must be really crazy, right? And that that is sort of what's motivating this very strong reaction. But for the most part, the UN just doesn't play the same role as it does for Democrats, which isn't really surprising given that the policy that's being proposed is sort of more consistent with what Republicans would want in terms of dealing with Iran. Okay, so let me wrap up and then I'll look forward to answering some questions. Because there's a couple of takeaways from this, right? I mean, one of which is just this idea that a model of public opinion that relies on party cues to determine the shape of or sort of the contours of American attitudes, I think, ignores the fact that most of us are not empty vessels waiting to be filled up by what our partisan leaders tell us. People have existing values and beliefs that anchor them and lead them in some cases to resist the messages that they receive from party elites. Now, this may not sound especially surprising, um, but it turns out that there is a lot of evidence that people are very likely to take cues. But what's important to think about is that that's just not always the case. Alternative cue givers, right, that is other actors who are not government or party officials, like foreign voices in this case, can move public opinion. We have empirical demonstration of that. And what's important here is, you can tell I really want you to see that because I underlined it. I, I guess I put a, should have put like OMG, OMG or something, right, to make it even more like obvious. But like, this is really important because this is even in the presence of bipartisan domestic consensus. Even when the leaders of the two major parties who control the levers of government decide that they think something should be done, does not guarantee that Americans will go along with it. And when, they, when Americans are presented with opposition from a reasonably credible source like the United Nations, can move some Americans against the messages that they are receiving from government officials themselves. And then finally, let me just come back to this point. Oh, I should say about the other thing is that we think back to, to Pat Tillman, right? The story that I started with about Tillman expressing this, this dubiousness of the invasion of Iraq, right? I mean, this seems to suggest that what Tillman was expressing is something that is very much real to many Americans. Some, being, uh, some discomfort with American military action that is not supported by the international community, even if it is supported by elites domestically. Tillman is not so unusual after all. Okay, and finally, back to this point about the media. I mean, um, if, I think what this shows is that if Americans are given access to alternative sources of information, if they are given access to perspectives different from the ones that they're receiving from their party leaders, they will not necessarily mechanically follow what those party messages tell them. Right? They will, in some cases, be willing to respond to those alternative messages. And so that means that the media's decisions about which, which people are newsworthy, which Voices they are willing to incorporate into the news have a strong effect, potentially, on what Americans think the United States government should do, whether in foreign policy or domestic policy. Right? 
And so those kinds of decisions, which political scientists haven't spent a lot of time investigating, I think it's something that needs more attention because it's those decisions that in many cases dictate which messages Americans have the, the opportunity to actually respond to. The last thing I'll show you is just obligatory shameless self-promotion. Some of you have seen this book, but if you haven't, right, you can buy the book. You can buy it on the Kindle. It's only $9.99. Uh, this, is, this, is this is a book that, um, that uh, Matt Gardino and I wrote. Uh, this is not about the uh, Iran material that I talked about today. This is actually all about the lead up to the Iraq War, where a very similar dynamic played out and that a lot of Americans skeptical of the invasion of Iraq um, uh, as was Pat Tillman, sort of responded to media coverage of uh, foreign voices, that is, opposition from overseas, and that had a pretty profound impact on, on public opinion. So anyway, I'm sure you'll go out and buy it right now. OK, uh, I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Thanks for your attention. Uh, I have a small question about your methodology with this experiment that you've run. Have you considered running a manipulation check to make sure that it's not just an effect of well, two people disagree with Obama, and therefore, you know, we disagree with Obama. In terms of, like, you know, instead of pulling that out from just being about Boehner and just being about the UN, you know, like running uh, Joe Baker from Minnesota disagrees with Obama, and the Tennessee Women's Council is you know, in Yeah, yeah. Obama, that sort of yeah, thing. this is a really good question, right? So the question, like, if I can, if I get what you're saying, the question is, is this an effect of the UN, or is this just an effect of opposition, right? That is, all Democrats need is some opposition, and then they will respond to that. Is that a fair kind of rendition? That's a great question. So I don't, so I, I don't have definitive evidence that it's not th what you say, that Joe Baker or whatever the organization was, I wasn't familiar with it, right? You know, like from Tennessee, right, wouldn't have the same effect. Um, I can spe I'll speculate a little bit about what I think would happen if we did that. So one thing is you can imagine is that um, there's some uh, minimal level of credibility that most Americans um, uh, need in order to respond to a messenger, right? Um, and so in this case, the UN is a reasonably credible institution, at least to Democrats, right? Now, Republicans don't have a lot of love for the UN, um, and so this is one of the reasons that you wouldn't expect their responsiveness to be as, um, as robust. Um, but uh, it's not clear whether um, a random citizen being quoted in the newspaper uh, or you know, people in an experiment like this being told that a random citizen is against it would produce the same effect. I would suspect that the effect would be weaker. Right? I don't know that it wouldn't be there because I think you're right that some of what people are looking for is hearing some message that confirms their underlying predispositions. If they hear that, then they may be willing to respond. Um, the reason that I think that this is still a pretty good test is because this actually reflects the way the world works, right? That is, in foreign policy debates, the most prominent actor, the actor that tends to be most likely an alternative cue giver that gets attention, are these international institutions like the UN. And so we think we're doing a decent job of replicating um, sort of the environment in which Americans would actually make these decisions in the real world. Um, but you're absolutely right. We have not ruled out the alternative hypothesis that it's just simply that Democrats, in this case, need some message from, other, um, from somebody. Um, and I, my, get, my, my intuition is that there's probably some kind of sliding scale, right? That is, an interest group that has some role in foreign policy is probably more credible than a random citizen. Um, a random citizen is probably more credible than an armadillo. I, you know, I, you're, you, know some, you can imagine something along those lines. But I, it's, it, but it's a really good question. I, I think you're, I think that's it's something that probably other studies would do well to try to add conditions and sort of test that kind of thing.
Yeah, so, so the second thing, we don't have a pre and post design, right? So we don't have, this is not a measure of change, right? We're just, this is just a, you know, between subjects to design in which we're just comparing across the treatment groups. Um, there's pros and cons to doing sort of a pre and post. Um, one thing is, is just obviously in an experiment like this, you have these proximate measures, and so you don't know whether you, you could actually produce change of the sort that you might imagine. Um, as to the first question, uh, we did not have a pure control group where there's no, um, information about um, Banner and the UN, largely just because of sample size considerations. We had, a, we knew we were going to have, a, by the time the CCS was done in the post-election survey, we knew we were going to have seven or 800 people left, and so we wanted to be able to have the power and the conditions that we, um, uh, that we had. But we have another experiment that we conducted on a convenience sample. If you're familiar with Amazon.com's Mechanical Turk, um, the way that some of these some surveys have been done, we did a Mechanical Turk study in 2011, where we had a condition, not a pure o Obama condition, but we had the we had the study designed in a different way. That in that situation, it was Boehner proposing these airstrikes, and then the UN and Obama were responding to that. We did have a condition in which we had only Boehner, right? That in Republicans, that is no Obama and no UN. So we could test and see what happened when they then entered. We basically got the same kinds of patterns here. Um, but, it, but we don't know for sure if it would work exactly the same way because it's a little bit of a different scenario when you have the Speaker of the House proposing a military action, which is unusual, right, as opposed to the President. Um, based on the patterns in that other experiment where the conditions are a little bit different, um, I'd be surprised if anything would be fundamentally different um, if we had a pure control group here, um, but but I'm not totally sure. Since you talked about in terms of the study, you made a fairly strong hypothesis that the ways in which media, in fact, present foreign voices um, um, does and will, in fact, shape public opinion. When you go to the Iraq War, which you've got this massive lies in the middle of it, and you have all that debate, and you have a fairly large congressional agreement. Uh, what what did you find when you assess what media had done with the Iraq War? Right. Um, see, this is what the book is all about. So one of the so just briefly to describe that. Let me briefly describe my book that I worked on for four years. Right. So, uh, so, so, so this is like this is an entree for me to. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, what, so how long do we have? Okay. So um, this is my version of the filibuster, right? So I never actually have to answer your question. So, um, so what we did is, so we we did this m massive content analysis of uh, news coverage in the lead up to the war, and then we merged that with public opinion data, um, so that we could actually see the, over time, over the eight month, the period eight months before the war, sort of how um, the voices that appeared in the news were affecting Democrats and Republicans and independent support for the for the war. Um, and what we found is that um, uh, it, about a third of all of the sources or, or all of the statements about the war that appeared in American media um, were from foreign sources. So from the UN, from Jacques Chirac, from um, other European leaders who were opposed to the war. 65% of all of the statements that were opposed to the war that appeared in the American media um, were from foreign leaders. That is. This, so that's another way of saying this is that if Americans were hearing opposition in the news, which is where most people get information about politics, right? They were hearing it from a foreign source. Democrats were virtually silent, partly by virtue of choice, right? That is, the Democrats didn't want to talk about this issue, and so they were strategically trying to avoid it. But also because the media largely marginalized the Democratic voices in Congress, Robert Byrd and other people who were actually um, uh, spending a lot of time talking about this, the media ignored them and didn't incorporate them into the news. And so what ultimately happened is that um, as um, the foreign opposition in the news rose and fell, that affected the opinions of Democrats and independents in the U.S. who, would, who had sort of more dovish predispositions or were more skeptical of this. It had no effect on Republicans, right? Republicans are getting a strong predisposition cue from a Republican president, George Bush, um, and they weren't affected by the UN or foreign opposition. It was only Democrats and independents who were. And so that suggests that um, if, with a very different research design, which is all observational data with this content analysis and survey data than, um, different this, than this experiment, that when the media incorporate these voices and there's these sort of weak or s the silence or um, predisposition inconsistent cues from party leaders like Democrats in that case, then you get the same kind of dynamic. 
Yeah, so, so, this is, so this would be a really interesting way to sort of test the question that you raise. Right? So, so is this domain specific, right? And, and I suspect it largely is. I suspect that most Americans probably wouldn't be particularly persuaded by um, uh, Francois Hollande's criticism of the, you know, President Obama's handling of the shutdown, for example, um, in part because most Americans think that the shutdown is handled terribly, but also just because it's not clear why a French president would have any credibility to sort of criticize the U.S. government. So I suspect that um, the alternative cue givers who are likely to matter most in domestic policy debates are not foreign voices, right? In most cases, those are probably going to be the interest groups that are incorporated into the media like the NRA or social movements like Occupy Wall Street, or in its earlier days, the Tea Party, when it was less a part of the Republican Party and more a separate social movement. Um, so uh, I, I, Matt and I actually have a, a grant proposal now under review to try to answer these questions. So I can't answer your question empirically. One thing I'd say, though, is that an interesting case here is climate change. Right? So climate change is a intermestic policy, right? It's not an international policy, but it's not an entirely domestic policy because, of course, the consequences of carbon pollution, right, sort of are, are not bound by borders. Um, and so one of the things we're doing is we're trying to, we're in the process of conducting another study to determine whether these foreign voices in the U.S. media sort of get incorporated in debates over climate change, in part because political leaders in the United States <coughs> haven't talked about it much. There's sort of a vacuum of leadership on that issue other than President Obama mentioning it in, in the State of the Union address very briefly. Otherwise, most American political elites have been silent on it. And so, we're, so that's one case we can imagine that Americans might be somewhat willing to listen to the perspectives of foreigners on this issue that is not a purely domestic policy. But I suspect that in most domestic policy debates, foreign voices probably wouldn't have that much credibility to Americans and probably wouldn't matter as much. They also are unlikely to get incorporated in the media, and thus Americans aren't ever going to hear Francois Hollande's criticism of you know, Barack Obama's handling of the shutdown or whatever. How do you account for the, the finding in um, the third treatment group where those who self-identify as Republican um, were completely unaffected by the fact that uh, both the president and the UN who are um, counter, you know, elite consensus group, were for it, but their own party was against it, but it didn't seem to phase them at all. Is it a strength of predisposition issue, or? That's, that's our interpretation, right? I mean, this is a story about predispositions being more important, perhaps, than the existing literature supposes. So the existing literature, right, if you take a strong party cue-taking story, would say that the difference between the first treatment and the third treatment for Republicans should be really big, because they've just been told that their party leader opposes this thing that a, a, a Democratic president who, that we know is ruining the world, mm -hmm. right, and the UN also ruining the world, mm -hmm. right, Th these two groups are aligned in support of this thing, and our party leader thinks that we shouldn't do it, yet they don't move significantly. No, they move, but it's just not big enough given the sample sizes for that to be statistically significant, and it's actually not a big move if we look at the range of movement on the other treatments and the other, um, if for Democrats especially. So what I think that suggests is that this is a hawkish policy action, something that Republican identifiers say, yeah, we should threaten Iran with military action, and maybe this is the way to solve the problem. So opposition from a party leader that's contravening their, their predispositions doesn't move them that much. Right? And so it also suggests that um, the kind of out-party polarization, the idea that um, Republicans in this case right, will just react negatively to whatever Obama wants to do, isn't quite right. If Obama wants to do something that is somewhat in line with what Republicans' predispositions might suggest is a good idea, they might be willing to listen. Unfortunately, I think oh. Travis Sorry about <laughs> Oh, good. That. Travis is going to ask a question. Yeah. I can... <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thanks.